God again. And I, I said, uh, no, I'm not sure I do. Rich, why not? Well, I'm not sure that they took into account the data selection bias correctly. Uh, data bias selection, what's that, he's asked. This eminent physicist was saying he accepted global warming, but he had never looked into it in any depth himself. And he, his, because of his credentials, people were believing it. This is something a scientist should never do. Should never say, well, because I'm a scientist, my off the cuff conclusions should be spread as science. But boy, we see a lot of that. Watch out for it. So my daughter, uh, who was then working in the UK, uh, got all sorts of problems of things that required an expert on energy. And I'd written the book, uh, Physics for Future Presidents and Energy for Future Presidents, uh, which I don't see here. Oh, here it is. Yeah, Physics and Energy for Future Presidents. Plus the textbook, which I didn't drink because it's too heavy, as those of you who took the course know. And they needed a consultant on energy. So I started consulting for my daughter. She hired me to work on energy. What we decided was would be better for us to set up our own consulting firm. We called it Muller and Associates. She was the CEO, I was the chief scientist. And in Muller and Associates, um, we, 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 we were consulting with countries around the world on energy. She had a great background. She had been to uh, 24 different countries to help them improve their governance, as it's called. And I was the energy expert. But then there came this query from Bangladesh. What should they do about global warming? And Elizabeth said, well, what can you say? I said, well, I'm not even sure global warming is real. And this was a problem. So many of the questions were related to global warming and I wasn't even sure it was real. So she suggested we set up a nonprofit organization to study global warming. We use, um, we, 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 we do the best possible job using completely objective methods to determine whether global warming was real and how bad it was. So uh, we did that. Yeah, let's see if I can change the page. Oh, these are, <laughs> on the left is an op-ed I wrote in, uh, the Wall Street Journal uh, explaining, this was decades ago, this is when, <clears throat> instead of the meeting in England, it was in Copenhagen. And I, I explained uh, some of the real serious issues with approaches to global warming. I was generally considered a skeptic. In my first book, I was highly skeptical of most of the results of global warming. That's the Physics for Future Presidents book. But on the up and on the right, those the a conversion of a climate change skeptic. That was an op-ed published in the New York Times. In case you don't know what an op-ed is, uh, it's the uh, guest editorial that appears opposite the true editorial in these journals. And I had the privilege of being a, <laughs> of having my submissions to these major newspapers accepted and published. I've, I've written nine, eight or nine op-eds in the New York Times in the Wall Street Journal. So I changed my mind. How did I change my mind? Well, I put together a team. We created a nonprofit called Berkeley Earth. And these are people, some of them in the, are in the physics department here. One of them was a, a Sol Perlmutter is on that list. Uh, he had not yet won his Nobel Prize. We were writing the paper, this, the, the conclusions when it was announced he had won the Nobel Prize. Not for this work, obviously. Uh, Bob Jacobson, uh, Robert Rohde was a, was a postdoc. Art Rosenfeld was on the faculty here. Jonathan Wordley. Uh, David Brillinger is wonderful at statistical analysis. Uh, Zeke Hausfather. Anyway, we did the study and concluded this was a great revelation. This was our own compilation of data with a fit to the shape 
that basically demonstrated that, that world temperature change was driven by two factors. One of them was the increase in carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. And the other was these dips, which are due to volcanic eruptions. And the volcanic eruptions were completely due to, due to uh, ashes. Well, the, the, the measurements were ashes collected in Greenland from ash that had been come from the volcanoes, erupted high into the stratosphere, blocked the sunlight, eventually came down and, uh, and, and settled out. So now I was no longer a skeptic. Global warming was real. The, the IPCC results were approximately right. I felt we, had, we, we openly addressed all of the major issues that had been raised by the skeptics. And to this day, I still consider myself the best person to convince a skeptic that global warming is real. Uh, I've never failed with a skeptic who's willing to sit down with me and listen to what I have to say. That doesn't mean that everything you hear about global warming is real. There are many things that aren't, there are many things that are exaggerated. Uh, but global warming is real. Temperature has gone up one and a half degrees Celsius in the last 150 years. Uh, and it's caused by human emitted carbon dioxide. And we make that case. The organization is called Berkeley Earth. We're still doing work. Berkeley Earth still exists, but I'm not involved very much anymore because I'm on the next step, the next direction in the random walk. This one again came about when my, when my daughter, Elizabeth, said, uh, okay, so using truly objective methods, addressing every systematic, we concluded that global warming is real. Is it a problem? And analyze it every way I could. I could not reach a scientific conclusion that it would be bad. But I could reach a personal conclusion that I didn't want to take that risk. That when you get big changes like that, that odds are that it's bad. If I say, oh, you're going to have a baby? Uh, can I randomly, can I, can, I, <laughs> can I mutate the genes of the baby? And no, 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 no. I, I like the way he'll, he'll, he'll be. Uh, I'm about to have another grandchild any day now. Uh, random changes are usually bad. And global change, global warming would, will probably be bad. What does bad mean? Well, I'm not sure what global warming will do. It may make crops grow better. But it may make some regions not have good crops. And that could lead to war. And that's bad. So I decided, Elizabeth and I, that we would devote our next project to stopping global warming from happening. And her thought was, use the same objectivity that we had used in determining that global warming was real, but use it now for its solutions. We looked at all the solutions that were being proposed and they applied objectivity to them. And quite frankly, we couldn't find any solutions that really worked. Well, that's not quite true. We found three. And everything else would not work. No electric cars wouldn't do the job. No, I didn't think solar and, and wind would do the job. That's a whole nother talk all by itself. Energy efficiency was one of the key things you needed to do. And as we traveled around the world and found, found people outside of the US using more energy efficiency than we did in the US, we realized, and, and great research programs in the US to improve energy efficiency. We fundamentally realized the two of us couldn't do much to advance that field. So for that reason and that reason alone, we decided not to pursue that course. Not because it wasn't important, not because it wouldn't work. It would work and it was important, but we couldn't contribute anything. Next thing we looked at was natural gas. That seems like an odd thing, given the fact that the Sierra Club was saying it's a carbon energy source, it's bad. But if we look at it objectively, if we switch from coal to natural gas, the savings in carbon being dumped into the atmosphere would be enormous. And it has this great advantage that it is as cheap as coal. And what that means is that you can convince the developing world to do it. 
And what my previous analysis had shown, well, it wasn't my analysis, so everybody knows this, just nobody says it, that most of the global warming is coming from China, India, will be coming from China, India, and the developing world. Whatever you do uh, in the United States, if we go to zero today by spending a little, whatever it takes, and we stay at zero, if what we do does not set an example that China and India can afford to follow, they're not going to follow it because they're not wealthy countries. And so us going to zero with Tesla cars and other expensive technologies isn't going to work. So, but China has huge amounts of natural gas. If we can help them switch from natural gas, from coal to natural gas, we were doing enormously more than anything else that's being done today, including energy efficiency. So we created a company. This is about the time I was retiring. We created a company from Global Shale. We actually went over to China. We actually reached a deal with the Chinese utility. We were going to bid with them on the next project for natural gas. We were going to show them how to frack. Fracking, we thought, was good because it would stop global warming and we reduce air pollution at the same time. And eventually we would switch off natural gas, but for the next 50 years, it can have an enormous impact on reducing global warming. Unfortunately, China is not, uh, boy, if you think things are screwed up in, in our government, nothing like they are in China. And that's a whole nother talk about how China was, uh, uh, we had this agreement, we're going to go ahead. They were going to have a, a new bid, and then they delayed the bid. And it was largely due to uh, the Communist Party, who wanted to exercise micro control over everything that happened. And they never got around to making the bid, until putting, it, putting things up for bid. And so we're still waiting on that. So in our frustration, Elizabeth and I turned to nuclear power, because that was the third stand of the tripod. Nuclear power is clean. What could we do? We joined a something called the Nuclear Forum. In the Nuclear Forum, this, we, weekly discussions on what could be done to bring nuclear power back, since it was basically carbon free, not completely, but mostly carbon free, and could be made a lot cheaper, and could be used widely by uh, in the developing world. Uh, in fact, China, it turns out, as of today, is developing approximately 50 nuclear reactors. They're going full speed uh, on nuclear power because they recognize that it, it, it solves their air pollution problems as well as addresses their electricity needs. See if I can get this to work again. Okay, so well, there's a picture of us in China. Um, you could pick me out there, uh, third from the right, uh, standing next to my daughter. Um, and to the, in, in the middle is Marlon Downey, who was our oil and gas expert in Texas. He'd read one of my books. He'd read the Energy for Future Presidents and Physics for Future Presidents. And he contacted me and said, uh, Professor Muller, uh, I am a real expert in shale gas and, and in energy. And I read your books. This is the first time I've read a book in which I couldn't find anything to disagree with. So he and I became friends. And he joined our company to do this in China. Trivia question. What city in China is this picture taken? The answer was stated correctly. It was Wuhan, long before Wuhan became famous in the United States. Are you from Wuhan? No, but you're from, you've been to China. You, you know China. OK. OK.
I'll start with a fancy transition. So we joined something called the Nuclear Forum. In the Nuclear Forum, we were uh, having the, 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 these discussions on nuclear power. And in one of the presentations, I saw that thing at the bottom. This is how, where do you dispose of nuclear waste? It, the, the feeling was that nuclear accidents were no longer the major impediment. Despite Fukushima, the major impediments were the unsolved nuclear waste problem, which came as a surprise to me. I knew a lot about nuclear power. I had been on the American Physical Society study of, of safety of light water nuclear reactors in 1970 something. I knew a lot about it, but the thing at the bottom struck my eye. It was called deep borehole disposal. And my reaction was, oh, 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 why didn't I think of that? Of course, that's where you should put the waste. That's obvious. Ah. So afterwards, I asked the speaker, I said, tell me more about deep borehole. They said, oh, I don't know anything about it. I put that in just to be complete because I heard someone working on it. So I called up Bob Budnitz, who I knew knew a lot about waste. He said, oh, yeah, deep borehole. So that's being studied uh, by the Department of Energy. Uh, oh, this talks a little bit about, about, about nuclear waste. Now, let me, let me talk about this now. There's 90,000 tons of nuclear, of, of commercial nuclear waste. 90,000 tons. Sounds like a lot. But if you filled a football field, it would only be that deep. It really isn't that much. Which means you could put it in boreholes. And I knew that the fuel was already in the right format to be put in boreholes. I knew that because of the work I've been doing with, with natural gas. So it was a wonderful connection between two fields. We talked to. Um, we, we, we talked to experts in the nuclear field. And they said, you can't put in boreholes. You can't retrieve it. It's a requirement that if you put it down there, you must be able to retrieve it. And we talked to our experts like Marlon. He said, retrieval, that's trivial. We do it all the time. We're always putting things down there, leaving them behind, and then coming back and getting it. So the nuclear people didn't know that boreholes would satisfy the minimum needs. Uh, the, the borehole people had no idea that nuclear waste is so compact that, that you could fit this. A, a lifetime of waste from one nuclear reactor, the whole lifetime of waste could fit in 10 to 20 boreholes. So they didn't realize how compact it was. So what we did, and I think of this as, as, as maybe my fix the oil, crack the oil pipeline moment. By bringing these two technologies together, we, 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 we had a solution. So next, we're going to make a presentation to the nuclear forum. Uh, but before I did that, I wanted to check with a real nuclear expert. So I called up Per Peterson, who was chairman of the Department of Nuclear Power and Nuclear Energy here, uh, nuclear technology. And I said, Per, uh, I have an idea for nuclear waste, uh, a way to dispose of it. You, he had been on the blue ribbon panel, which was to discuss how, how to dispose of it. And I said, can I show it to you? And he said, sure, it's OK. Come on over. OK, so I, I could tell from his tone of voice, he thought we had absolutely nothing. So Elizabeth and I, my daughter and I, went over there. We made this presentation to Per Peterson. In the beginning, he was sort of smiling, waiting for us to make our first big blunder. And then he was going to correct us and show where we were wrong. And half an hour later, he said, my God, Rich, you solved the problem. Wow. A huge problem. Well, a lot to go. So I told him that we we're going to give a talk to the nuclear forum. We were going to show it to the Department of Energy. He said, no, no, no. No, you want this to work, you have to start a company. Why is that? Well, because if you give it to the Department of Energy, they are not allowed to consider other methods of disposal of nuclear waste other than putting it underground at Yucca Mountain, Nevada. What do you mean not allowed? It's the law. 1982, Nuclear Waste Policy Act. Amended 1987. States that the Department of Energy shall not investigate other locations or other methods of disposing of nuclear waste 
until nuclear waste is disposed at Yucca Mountain. What kind of a crazy law is that? Well, it's a law you pass when you're getting tired of people saying, oh, don't put it there. I have a better idea. I have, Shut up. We're going to make it the law. We're going to go to Yucca Mountain. Yucca will work. Well, it turns out the, the Democrats were the first to abandon it with Harry Reid. And then Trump came in and he abandoned it. Neither Democrats nor Republicans would go for Yucca Mountain. It was shut down, shut down by Barack Obama. And so now the law says you cannot even look at other kinds of nuclear storage or disposal until you put nuclear waste into this location which nobody in government wants to put it. That's a rough position for the United States to be in. Uh, and it was one of the reasons people said, don't start a company, this is hopeless. But the problem is so big that we decided <laughs> to go ahead anyway. And so he, her suggested, and my, my daughter Elizabeth, who had majored in math, not because she liked math, but because it was the easiest thing to major in, who upon graduation, I discovered that purely by accident, she had done a double major in math and literature uh, and went to graduate school in international business. So this is a perfect combination, the scientist and the businessman working together. And we created a company, a two-man company we called uh, Deep Isolation. So we were going to do it by a company. We have $60 billion in the nuclear waste fund. So we thought that some hope would get investors to say, look, we, it's already $60 billion set aside. And so this is a big market. And we have an idea that will work and nobody else does. So uh, that's how we got started. We got some friends to put in little bits of money. This was her said there already is a program. Well, the, the thing I had, seen, show, had on that slide showed a borehole. So people were already thinking about it. Uh, found an article in Science Magazine showing a borehole design. The borehole is. That's the borehole in granite. And these are close-ups of parts of it. When I read about what this program was, my reaction is, why are they doing it the wrong way? What we had learned was that in, in, in oil and shale gas, what they do is they drill down maybe a mile and a half, and they go horizontally for two miles. It seems to me this is a much better way to store the waste, not piled on top of each other, but laid out along a two-mile stream. So. Uh, there's vast experience in, in building such things. This is a map of uh, North Dakota. And every one of those dots is a uh, oil, oil or gas well. And those lines, all oriented the same way, uh, are their horizontal sections two miles long. There's vast experience in building these kind of holes. We, we called up Schlumberger and said, could you drill holes of the following size and shape? And their answer was, oh, yes, that's no problem. Straightforward. No new development needed. Make it a little bit wider. But other than that, we know how to do it. OK. So I, I already said this. Uh, except for the bottom. <laughs> Most experts believe the public would, wouldn't, would oppose any solution. I'm going to show a, a brief little movie that shows how our system works. So let's see if I can get this to work. The global consensus is that the best way to dispose of nuclear waste from power generation and other applications is to put it into deep geological isolation. Deep Isolation is the first company to develop a complete process for disposing of waste using deep horizontal drill holes. This video introduces our process. Nuclear waste, specifically spent fuel, 
from commercial nuclear reactors is made of small ceramic pellets of a compound called uranium dioxide. These pellets are held in long tubes called fuel rods, and the rods are arranged into bundles called fuel assemblies. The shape and size of a fuel assembly depends on the type of reactor it comes from. In a pressurized water reactor, fuel assemblies measure 12 inches diagonally and typically 13 feet long. Each fuel assembly can hold more than 250 fuel rods and 100,000 pellets. As of today, no spent nuclear fuel has been disposed of in the world. Spent fuel is still above ground, in pools, or in storage casks. In deep isolations process, we place fuel assemblies containing spent fuel into special canisters that fit into deep drill holes and are designed to prevent the escape of radioactive materials. Each canister is made of a highly corrosion-resistant nickel-chromium-molybdenum alloy that will remain a barrier for containment of radionuclides for tens of thousands of years. Burying the spent fuel assemblies deep in the ground provides permanent protection from the long-lived radioisotopes that can be harmful for up to a million years. To ensure protection, we bury the spent fuel in rock far below the water table and where liquids have been out of contact with the surface from hundreds of thousands to millions of years. We start by drilling a larger diameter hole. For this video, we assume it is 36 inches in diameter and several hundred feet deep. A steel pipe called a surface casing is inserted into the hole. Cement is pushed down the casing and up the space between the rock and the casing, providing an additional seal. The cemented steel surface casing provides isolation from aquifers during the fuel emplacement process. We then drill down several thousand feet and gently change direction of the drill hole until it is horizontal. At this depth, the diameter is only 18 inches, just enough to hold the casing and spent fuel canisters. We will only dispose of spent fuel in deep layers of rock that are extremely well isolated from the surface and where isolation can be verified using established and proven geologic methods. Now let's go back to the surface and look at how we put the spent fuel canisters into the deep drill hole repository using standard oil and gas equipment, such as a wire line and tractor assembly, coil tubing, or oil pipe conveyance. For this example, we have pictured a wire line and tractor assembly. The entire process above ground is done in a way that provides a safe environment for personnel and the public. The first canister is slowly lowered down the drill hole. Deep underground, the drill hole gently turns eight degrees every hundred feet to the horizontal section. Those canisters are about 13 inches in diameter and 14 feet long. And they contain single uh, fuel assemblies from a uh, nuclear reactor. The spent fuel canister easily travels around this gentle curve without any distortion, a technique successfully developed over the last 20 years. Wheels on the tractor assembly help the canister move along the horizontal section of the drill hole. The first canister is in place. The tractor assembly is released from the canister and withdrawn. This process is repeated until all the spent fuel is in place in the horizontal section of the drill hole. The vertical part of the drill hole is sealed with rock and other materials. Within a few years, the enormous weight of the rock above compresses these materials and provides an excellent seal to the narrow access hole. Deep Isolation is the only company in the world with a demonstrated and patented solution for the deep geological isolation of nuclear waste using horizontal drill holes. A solution that is fast, cost-effective, risk-averse, and available now the global consensus is that the best way to dispose. Okay, when, you, when you're in a business, you make movies like that to explain to potential investors, to explain to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, to put everything together. It's something you generally can't afford to do when you are in private research, but for this kind of development, uh, it plays an essential role. So there's one more movie I'd like to show you, which is a test we did in Texas. In this test, we took a somewhat smaller canister, but exactly the size of canister that contains the worst of the US nuclear waste, the so-called cesium and strontium waste up at the Hanford lab. So this, these canisters were dummies. They contained equal weight to a canister, 
but the, the point was to put it down in the hole, uh, pull the, the, the wire back up, show we can retrieve it because the US government requires that we be able to demonstrate retrievability. So this is a, a mini documentary of a test we did in Texas in 2019. You are about to witness a significant milestone for the nuclear waste industry. A crew of oil and gas drillers is setting up for a demonstration that will showcase how it is possible to safely store nuclear waste. I just want to say thank you, everyone, for daughter. being here with us today. We're really excited that we've come so far in the past year, that we've had um, support largely from individuals in order to take us here. Um, so the, we, we, we've really done the impossible when it comes to uh, getting a toehold in an industry um, that many people thought could, could never change. Welcome all y'all to Milam County. I wish it was a little better weather, but <laughs> get what we take. Uh, we're very fortunate to have this facility here in our county. We appreciate deep isolation. Welcome them anytime. Just before this first part of the demonstration was completed, the attendees were given a tour of the rig in action. Our canister at the moment is still attached to that wire, but is about half a mile deep now and probably somewhat along the horizontal section as well. So we haven't yet gotten the signal that it's been released, um, but, but we're, we're getting there. What we do is we activate the hanger with a tool called a resolve tool. That sets the hanger. And then we unscrew from the hanger and we retract the tractor. Everyone watched as the wire cable was retracted. Oh, there it is. Yeah, okay. We decided to make a go. big deal when the wire came up and it was empty. So oh, yay! You can see where the wheels are. Real excitement is will the canister actually not be there? So we are hoping for no canister. That will mean success. She left the canister below. As the afternoon turned to evening, Leave it there the crew for placed hours. the wire cable with its tractor back into the hole go back so it down. could latch onto the buried canister and retrieve it. Deep Isolation's CEO and COO waited to see if the canister could be brought to the surface successfully. My boss. This approach was previously considered impossible by many nuclear experts, in part because of the challenge of retrieval. This second part of the demonstration would prove that, should it ever be needed, the buried nuclear waste could be retrieved. And is it there? Is it there? Yeah. Is that it right there? Yeah. 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 What just happened? We got our canister back. So this is proof definitively that canisters deep underground and horizontal drill holes are indeed retrievable. This is it. That was considered a great breakthrough by the nuclear industry uh, that we had actually done this thing, which the drilling industry said was straightforward. We're just bringing two, two industries together. That was a major achievement. I'm gonna go pretty quickly at this point. Uh, what's that? Five minutes. Okay, so I'm gonna skip over what fission is. Uh, the fact that most fission fragments come in two groups that there's a huge amount of radioactivity. When you turn off a nuclear reactor, the chain reaction stops. You still have 6% of the power just from the nuclear decay of the, mostly of the fission fragments, where they mostly decay pretty quickly. Nuclear waste is uh, popularly seen as canisters of sludge and slime. Uh, it's nothing like that. Uh, well, maybe it is. Uh, these are nuclear waste canisters, but they don't have slime in them. What they have are little ceramic pellets, just like this. 
these are not actually, this is not actually nuclear waste, but it, it's actually just, these are two, I had, I'm sorry, these are, these are just two uh, lithium iron batteries. Um, but, but that's the size of the pellets and they're made out of ceramic. This is San Onofre. There, if you look at the right, upper right, you'll see they're stored partially underground right next to the sea. That's storage, that's not disposal. Nobody accepts that as being disposal. That is, I've done 20 years at a time. People are worried that if we keep on leaving it above ground like that, that's where it'll wind up. Uh, two thirds of it is not, is 60% is not in even that, it's in cooling pools. All that heat dissipates away. Um, and uh, this, this, is, this is a diagram showing the nuclear reactor with these long uh, 12 inch by 14 foot uh, cores with fuel rods in them and uh, don't have time to go on, but this is where they are in the US. This is where nuclear waste is. Those are all the locations where we have nuclear waste. It, it, it's there, it's just on the surface. The public is unhappy about that. We did a survey in the 23 states that have nuclear waste. We did a survey, we paid for a survey, picking a firm that was really, did not let us ask any leading questions. To the people in your state, pick a state. You have nuclear waste in your state. We have, pick one of the three options. Option number one, take it out of the state to some temporary storage location far away. Option two, just leave it where it is for now until we have a solution that you really like. Option number three, put it a mile underground where it is now at the nuclear reactor. 82% voted for putting it underground where it is now. Our concept is go down a mile. Most geologies are just fine. We evaluated the geologies at great length. Uh, it's a global market with a lot of money. Worldwide, uh, the, the, uh, the estimated effort is $667 billion is what people plan to spend. So if we have a better way of doing it, the investors get interested. If we can get just a fraction of this. Uh, we'll have a good company. And at the same time, we will be doing our role in stopping global warming. It's really the best of all worlds. This is Yucca Mountain, shut down. It's a big tunnel. This is a diagram of Yucca Mountain. I could give you a whole talk on that. This is up in Finland where they have an underground uh, repository, which they hope to open uh, within, uh, within a year or two. Uh, it's very expensive. This is what ours looks like. We've published lots of papers, odd for a company to publish papers, but these are all peer reviewed papers and peer reviewed journals, plus we have 17 patents. What we work in these papers is detailed model simulations of how the radioactivity will leak. We do a grid. Uh, this is done mostly by Stefan Finsterly, who is one of the world's experts in underwater water flow. We look at the radiation that comes out and look at the red line on the right. And that, that at a million years, a million years afterward, we finally get some radioactivity coming out. And it's a factor of a thousand lower than is allowed. So, there is safety in depth. We're beating it by a factor of a thousand. What happens if you put it in an earthquake fault? Oh, we tried different geologies, simulations, many different ranges of, of, of things. Uh, will the radiation go back up the borehole? It turns out it doesn't, even if the borehole is only poorly filled with completely uh, disintegrated cement. This, this is all the physics. What about an earthquake fault? You know, we worried a lot about earthquake faults. This was a fast path to the surface. But the, the flow rate of the material as it goes up begins to diffuse out. And as it diffuses out, it gets weaker and weaker and weaker. And you have an exponential reduction in the amount that gets to the surface. And it turns out even a San Andreas type earthquake fault going right through our repository does not 
violate the safety limits with silver factor of 100 uh, safety. So it really works. Uh, there are radioisotopic measurements that we can take that show that that could be used to determine that the water down below is, 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 is ultra safe. Oh, and that's the end of my talk, except that I'm doing other things too. So I just wanted to give you two slides, maybe three, on what else I'm doing, because I don't know what random direction I'm going to be going in next. My whole life has been one where I couldn't predict six or seven years ahead of time where I would be or what I would be doing. That I would be a garbage collector. It, it's fun. It, to, to my my eight year old uh, grandchild, uh, he says, uh, "What do you do, Grandpa?" He said, "Well, I do two things. I'm saving the world, and I'm a garbage collector." Um, but but this is an op-ed I wrote in the Wall Street Journal on the origins of COVID. I've done a lot of work on the side. Well, uh, that, that indicates that COVID originated from the Wuhan laboratory. But it's also true that when you do all this work, it doesn't mean you don't take breaks. So Elizabeth and I and our families took a break. Oh, this is uh, the current status of the business. Let me just skip that. And here we are in Africa. And over in that car, you can see Elizabeth, her husband, and my two grandkids. This elephant is coming between us, breaking us up. <laughs> I actually have a movie of that. Uh, and you got to watch a lion hunting a, 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 a warthog. Uh, so these are all photos I took. We did this uh, in mid-July. I just wanted to show you this to say that the fact that you're doing such complex work doesn't mean you don't have a strong family life, and you must. I think, uh, we, we, I, I think having a good life at home is absolutely essential to having a productive, inter interesting life career as a scientist. So I want to end there and ask for questions. Yeah, the, 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 the rule for extraction, according to the US government, is that you need to be able to extract it for until you seal the well. For us, that would be after a year or two. We could leave it open if they want to extract it longer, but we're talking about decades, uh, not, not thousands of years. So the rock doesn't undergo much motion. We do have to worry about whether the rock will crush the hole in that period of time. And this is why we and the oil industry use this what's called casing. The holes are lined with a, a half an inch to one inch thick steel pipes uh, to hold it open for a while. We monitor that to make sure that if it's beginning to crush, we get the fuel out. Yeah. Okay, well, we have about 100 nuclear reactors. For a lifetime of nuclear fuel, you would require 15 holes per reactor. So we're talking about 1,500 holes. If we go big, what we have so far fits under, you know, one football field, only you have five feet deep. So it's, it's not very much, not compared to other, other uh, not, not, certainly not compared to coal or to oil. I mean, you know, coal, uh, we, we, we burn a cubic mile of coal, of oil, uh, every year. Uh, switch completely to nuclear would require all of our transportation to be electric. Um, and uh, I'm not very optimistic about that uh, for various reasons, but I know many, many people are. Uh, so yes, in principle, we could go all nuclear. We're not talking about, uh, right now, 20% of our energy comes from nuclear. So we would have five football fields worth every 50 years if all of the energy went uh, right nuclear.
Okay. Uh, the question is, how does we guarantee the simple waste doesn't leak into the subsurface water? Eventually, it does reach the subsurface water. We don't go into any area that has very deep subsurface water. There will be brine. Uh, but the surface aquifer is typically uh, uh, 200, 300 meters deep. We're going down one and a half kilometers. Below the surface aquifer, we have brine. And we measure the brine to make sure that no flow of brine is upward. If it were flowing upward, it would contaminate the. Else is sufficient to sustain poisoning? Yeah, that's right. Revolutionary battery chemistry that just developed. It was mainly the case. I think batteries are a great solution. I think the whole idea of focusing in on lithium ion batteries is insane. The most expensive kind of batteries, they're great for my cell phone because they're lightweight and I'm willing to spend a hundred bucks for the battery. But if you're going to store large amounts of energy, you, there's so many other battery technologies that are much cheaper where you don't have a weight cost. And, and just pushing lithium ion batteries for that. Is, is, is foolishness. Uh, iron sulfur batteries made out of cheap materials uh, and, and, and they could be used. So I think there's lots of room for battery technologies and getting the cost down so that you could use solar and wind more efficiently, I think is important. Storage technology is really important. And I, I, I believe that the battery storage is the most practical, but the, but the price has to, be, has to be brought down more. Uh, and we have to stop looking at these foolish examples of, of, of super expensive but lightweight batteries. Who needs lightweight if you're storing battery outside your factory? Richard, well, I guess maybe one more question and then we should probably uh, um, cut it off. Speculatively, do you think that nuclear fusion energy is on the way and this is a realistic solution? Yeah, nuclear fusion, I've, I've, I've been looking at that. And uh, back uh, 30 years ago, Nuclear fusion was seen seemed to be important for really three three reasons. Uh, one was that um, you were not going to run out of hydrogen as a fuel. But now we know we're not going to run out of uranium either. Methods have been developed to extract uranium out of seawater. They're cost effective. Uranium is not a big fraction of the cost. So the fuel issue has gone away. Uh, a second reason was the nuclear waste. They have, don't have the same high level of nuclear waste. But we can dispose of the nuclear waste in a really safe way. So I think the real, and the third one had to do with, with nuclear proliferation. And we can take the, the, this, this spent, spent plutonium, not recycle it, just put it down there a mile deep underground and it's virtually impossible uh, for terrorists to get to. So the real competition for nuclear fusion is nuclear fission. And the question becomes, is it going to be cheaper than that? And I'd say in the near future, no. In the long term, maybe yes. Oh, one more question over here. Yeah, I was wondering, um, recently, if you have watched any kind of projects, what their main argument was. So uh, the, the main skeptics say it's perfectly fine to keep it above ground. It, 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 this, uh, this, this storage is working fine. Uh, let's not muddy the waters. Let's go ahead and pull nuclear, knowing we can keep it above ground. Uh, we don't have to do that. Um, uh, other people say, well, you can't put it all above ground because some of it is relatively low level nuclear waste, and you get it, it doesn't, it's not so compact. So your reactor components would have to be made into small pieces in order to fit them into boreholes. So we're not proposing that. So, my repositories for low level nuclear waste still make sense. But uh, the main argument is uh, nuclear waste is no problem. It's not enough radioactivity. The skeptics tend to be even more uh, insanely from nuclear than I am. Let's uh, thank Rich and uh, probably ask you some more questions.